To the stream of jet engines, the barrage of photographers' flash bulbs, and the whirring of the cine cameras, the second team to reach our shores in 1965, the South Africans, touched down at London Airport. For me, it was a case of renewed friendships, because I've been lucky enough to have gone to South Africa in the winter, when I've been especially impressed by the performances of Colin Bland and the Brothers Pollock. After a short preliminary canter around the counties, the South Africans came to Lords for their first test. Well, I was there then, so I might as well join you now. OK. The first day of the new series against South Africa was played before a crowd of over 20,000. Their introduction to Barlow was brief, but they saw Lindsay, naturally a forcing bat, make a useful 40 runs. They saw Pollock and Bland in an 80-run partnership, giving good reason for their popularity in their own country. The first afternoon undoubtedly belonged to them, although they were made to work hard by our bowlers and fielders, Edridge in particular. After Barrington had caught Pollock, other introductions were brief. 17 to Peter van der Merwe, Remarkably like Mike Smith in many ways. Wears glasses, feels at close in short leg, worshipped by his team. A fine leader on and off the field. He certainly made a hit when on his arrival he came down the steps of the aeroplane and presented the secretary of MCC with a South African tie, wishing him a happy birthday. Of the rest, Jackie Botton hit a useful 33, a score which virtually matched the other Pollock, Peter, who was to prove one of the great successes of the tour though not on this occasion, nor in the English innings which followed. Saturday at Lord's lived up to the expectations of 26,000 spectators who'd come to see England bat and the South Africans field. This was exciting cricket. The game ebbed and flowed, and one never quite knew where the advantage lay. Commentators assessed and reassessed the position, and what's more, the sun shone. Of two things, there could be no doubt. First, Barrington, who batted for three hours, was complete master of the bowling, playing all the strokes, a law unto himself. Of the 338, which was to be England's final total, Ken scored 91 before falling to the other major feature of the test, the South African field. Secondly, the overall intensity of effort in the field by the entire touring side could never be faulted. It was an object lesson in run saving. And though every man contributed, there's no doubt that Bland was top of the bill. Perhaps the greatest outfielder of all time, he's superbly fit, trained to the minute, fast, loose, picks up the ball while running flat out and throws it in when off balance, hitting the stumps more times than not. He must save at least 30 to 40 runs every inning. innings appear to be giving England some hope of victory, though Barlow opened well with 52. But Lars only contributed nine, Lindsay came up with 22, while Graham Pollock was five, never shone at all. Bland settled down and began to hit the odd loose ball very hard, taking his score to 70 in the process.
Of the remainder, Backer's 37 and Skipper van der Merwe's 31 were the only major contributions to a score of 248, leaving England to get 191 runs in 236 minutes. Not a cricketing impossibility, but not easy. That fielding again. And Peter Pollock, whose main asset was his speed and his direction, which was always on the stumps. What troubled England most at this moment was the loss of Edridge after a blow on the head from Pollock. A blow which took him out of the game. Boycott departed, we had no Dexter, and our hopes rested on Bank. But his score was only 18. Out, LBW. In the half hour before tea, Cowdery and Smith made 30 runs between them. Then, 10 minutes after tea, Lindsay held Smith. The sands of time were running out. Parks, with only seven to his credit, was caught by Van der Merwe. Then Cowdery departed, leaving us with no hope other than that Titmus could hold the fort for 50 minutes. And long and gloomy minutes they were. The South Africans closed in, almost as if they were saying, if you insist on staying, we won't stop you, but by heavens, you'll not get a run out of us. In that 50 minutes, Brown was the last to go. Rumsey in turn was surrounded, and such was the pattern at both ends, we almost suffered from claustrophobia as we watched. 145 for seven. Time for another over, perhaps? The clock ticked on, the umpire made for his position at the wicket. And it was all over. South Africa had drawn at Lords in their first test match of the 1965 season. Cricketers live a nomadic sort of existence. With Lords behind them, it was off to Canterbury. Play the match, back into the coach for London, and immediately in train for Swansea to play Gamora. settle for a few hours, while away the time as any seasoned traveller does, no doubt sustained by the thought that though they may have drawn their test at Lord, it was to some extent a moral victory. So onwards, intent on proving their point. Onwards to yet another hotel, and then with a day or two in hand, a chance to quietly approve of Nottingham, that fine Midland city which has always moved with the times. They saw the sights, albeit briefly, and each in his own way enjoyed a few well-merited hours of relaxation on a fine summer's night. Then with the coming of the new day, they sped off over the river, bent on practicing, practicing hour after hour, each man neither sparing himself nor his colleague, always keeping the ball moving, the body supple, the mind alert. All this hard by the River Trent, in the splendid setting of Trent Bridge Cricket Ground. Here stands the famous George Parr's tree. It's a hundred years or more since the great player played the shot which gave its name. And the tree has long since been dwarfed by the high towers which sustain the massive banks of floodlights over the ground behind, upon which some other game is played. But cricket has its own surprises, and newcomers to Trent Bridge are always amazed to find that, not to be outdone electronically, the cricket ground boasts a huge scoreboard which gives more detail than any in the world, mainly at the touch of a button. Inside the Black Hulk, the men in control had recorded Graham Pollock's inspired century. Marked the fielders, and run by run made known the total as Colin Cowdery had restored the status quo for England. With South Africa, 
269 and England a little short at 240 on the first innings, they were showing 27 for one on the morning of the third day as the English team posed for pictures and fielded with high hopes of dismissing their visiting opponents cheaply. The South Africans, intent on a mammoth score, faced Larter. Having lost Lance the previous evening for a duck, they were none too pleased when Lindsay, who had already survived one appeal by Snow, fell subsequently to Colin Cowdery's catch off Larter's bowling, with their score at 35. But Backer was digging in. Ali Backer, whose performance is a triumph of temperament over skill, as his style would give most cricket coaches a fit. He's inclined to play across the ball, but he keeps his nut down and never gives in. And what a partner in this game he made to Barlow. Eddie Barlow likes to win the game and plays it hard. I might suggest that this aggressive and ebullient character will one day captain his country. On this day, he delighted us all. They both did, in fact, until Baka went LBW to Lata and was replaced by Graham Pollock. What can one say of him? Certainly the most brilliant young batsman we've seen since the early days of Neil Harvey and Don Bradman. He's learning to build an innings and then let fly with all his magnificent strokes. They said he couldn't play on the onside, but some of his hooking and hits to leg were as strong as any I have ever seen. As for his drive past extra cover, well, words fail even me. But now, suddenly, dramatically, the game changed. Barlow attempted to sweep Titmus and lost his leg stump. And a small child lost his way. Bland took his turn at the wicket. Took ten runs. Snow took the ball, and a full-length delivery was edged into the stumps. In the next over from Lata, Pollock played just a shade early and hit straight at Tipmus at wide mid on. So in 30 minutes, the initiative seemed to be passing back to England. The score, 232 for six. Fondamerva departed for four runs when Parfit caught him. Dumbrill suffered for a few moments, righted himself, and then reached an unlucky 13. I was going to say the bottom was rotten, but not quite. He added 18 for his country, and every little was to count in this match, including the 21 that the tail end partnership produced. McKinnon came out as sturdily built as the roller which followed him. England to bat wanted 319 to win. Three quarters of an hour left of the day. The night watchman would be Boycott and Barber. No, Boycott and Tipness. No, Boycott and Snow. Although at this juncture, Mike Smith had more need of rain. The fourth day. Two wickets gone for ten and 309 runs wanted. This was going to be a hot fight for England. Too hot. Snow melted. Ten for three. Boycott and Barrington might do something to extricate. No, Barrington out for one. Thirteen on the board. Cowdery to bat. Would he, as so often in the past, dig in? Could he be the hero of the hour despite the pressure? Twenty runs later, the answer was no. The boy got still there, the board read 41 for five. Then it was the turn of Peter Parfit, a man batting in the knowledge that some measure of success would carry him over the seas to Australia. And the failure at this juncture would assuredly leave him at home.
Boycott finally departed when his score stood at 16. Parfit was joined by Skipper. The South Africans were closing in with a vengeance, but for a while Mike Smith resisted, and in a partnership with Parfit that lasted an hour and 20 minutes, gave the latter a chance to establish himself. The partnership had added 65 runs when Pollock broke the stand with a leg break that got Smith LBW. Parks batting at number nine was just getting set when more gloom descended. This time, not in our hearts, but overhead. After tea and some rain and presumably an appraisal of the situation during tea, the England approach changed. Fours were being hit where before singles had been the order of the day against a bristling field. Parfit took his score to 50 and beyond. Then, just as we were beginning to wonder if this was to be a new match-winning partnership, the two Peters clashed for the last time. left the field, 14 short of his hundred. Pollock again. Goodbye to Cartwright. That was virtually the end. Parks was left to carry out his bat, while Larter was left to the mercy of Pollock. Virtually, but not quite. Larter had his moment of fun. One run, then two. Then two again. Then four. Then try. Oh, what a triumph for the Springboks and for the brothers Hop. In their relation, they left the field to celebrate, and the stumps were left to the tender care of the umpires. As had so often happened in the past, the result of the series once again depended on the final test on the Surrey side of the river. After the brilliant win at Trent Bridge, a draw was all that South Africa needed to take the rubber, whereas England had to win to draw level. The South Africans journeyed on with this in mind and the determination to sweep all before them. Their entrance to the Oval was as precarious for them as for us all. The Surrey Tavern had dissolved into a mass of scaffolding and concrete which will one day take on a far more imposing appearance. Had it been ready, no doubt the talk round the bars would have been of Statham, returned to the England side with all his old fire. Statham, who had Eddie Barlow LBW at 18 in a dull, sombre light that was to become abysmal later on, giving a clue as to the final outcome of the game. The honours in the first innings were not entirely Statham's. In England's best effort of the series, Higgs, wearing his England cap for the first time, bowled straight and well. He was responsible for the dispatch of four of the South African batsmen. Titmus accounted for Pollock when he had 12 on the board an essential wicket if ever there was one. The rest went to Statham, and with only one extra to add, the innings closed at 208, McKinnon being not out. The England first innings started fruitlessly, with Eric Russell parting company with his wicket for no score at all. Botton struck Barrington down on his home turf, and the wicketkeeper Lindsay sent Barber back to the pavilion after he'd batted for over two hours for... 40 runs. The Cowdery Parfit stand was the best of the day. 
50 in just over the hour, Parfit batting easily and confidently. And when he'd gone, it was left to Parks to partner Cadre as he took his 50. Parks, who took his score to 42 in only an hour. Five wickets had gone to Pollock for 45 runs. Tipmus, left high and dry, carried his bat. The English score, 202. Oh dear. Only six runs in it, but we remembered Trent Bridge. So for the last time, stay them to Barlow, Higgs to Lindsay. Then stay them again, and the bespectacled Barlow took his leave of the batting scene for 18. Brown bowled, Lindsay departed. Then the green light, which seemed to be shining for England, changed through amber to red, with the arrival of the wicket of the one-way traffic partnership of Pollock, who was confronted with some extremely tight hard bowling, and Backer. Pollock was not destined to succeed as he had at Nottingham. Backer, on the other hand, bettered his previous effort. The runs mounted. From 100 for two, through Backer's 50. 150 for three on the board, 163 at the close, and then Bland was rarely away, despite an early morning interruption when the other B, Backer, fell victim to state. The letter B was operative. Barber bowled to Bland, and it was bank holiday. The large crowd saw Colin Bland start off on his journey, get up to 50, and then change into top gear to give us one of the finest innings of the series. For now, we were seeing him at his best, showing some of us that what he had done at home he could do here. Proving himself to be a magnificent driver of the ball, straight through the covers, or high in the air over long on. For a while, he was matched by Tiger Lance, a hard-hitting batsman, who in turn reached his 50 before being bowled by him. Von der stay was brief, a duck. Dumbrill held the fort. Bland roared up to his century. England were in trouble, but the crowd gave best for a man who'd given his. Soon Dumbrill was replaced by Button, and Colin Bland left the oval pitch with the knowledge that at 127, the day was his and also his country's. Their flag flying as high as their score of 392. Ten minutes to five with a full day ahead of them. A cricketing possibility, weather permitting. What would be the outcome when the stumps were carried in for the last time? First honours went to Pollock, who caught Barber off his own bowling. <laughs> Parfit came out instead of Barrington, and then the light intervened. With precious minutes lost already, the fifth and final day saw the first hundred minutes usefully occupied by Russell, who saw his 50 up in his first home test, sharing the honours with Parfit. A hundred for one. Altogether, they added 99, the highest stand of the match to date. Now the chase was on. Bangton and Cowdery continued the attack, and English hopes were beginning to rise. 202 for three. Barrington's 50 came up. <laughs> 231 for three. Then 250 for three. Cowdery's 50 now and the runs flowed, though the South Africans were slowing their bowling rate. Then Pollock struck at Barrington and the score was 279 for four. Still a chance. Cowdery fought on. 300 came. 97 runs wanted, 70 minutes to go, and that was the end of the story. The rains came. The pitch was deserted. The stumps had been forgotten by the umpires, but not left thanks to the chairman of selectors. Whatever the outcome might have been, the South Africans proved that when it comes to brighter cricket, deeds count, not words. Thank <laughs> you.